Welcome back to the next part of our group chat. And uh, again, grateful for the Premier making time and grateful for the Minister making time. So we're going to have another conversation. Hi, Peter. You look good. I know everyone in this room is here to hear Peter Tertsakian, so hang tight. It's not just yet, but it's coming soon. Uh, to get to our next session. We, we have so much still to go, some great panels to go, some great heckling to do, I'm sure. But before we do that, let's bring Simon Dyer back up here, Executive Director of Pemina Institute, here to introduce the minister and welcome him. Simon, take to the stage. That is uh, Deputy Executive Director, Chris. Yeah, it's good to see you. <laughs> you just got a promotion. Yeah, exactly. That's, uh, <laughs> it is my uh, great pleasure to welcome the Honorable Jonathan uh, Wilkinson to uh, uh, today. Jonathan Wilkinson was first elected as Member of Parliament for North Vancouver in 2015. He's previously served as Minister of Natural Resources, as Minister of Environment and Climate Change, and as Minister of Fisheries, Oceans, and the Canadian Coast Guard. Raised in Saskatchewan, Minister Wilkinson spent more than 20 years in the private sector, holding leadership positions with a number of companies dedicated to development of green technologies. Minister Wilkinson's work as Chief Executive Officer of Questair Technologies and Biotech Environmental Technologies and as Senior Vice President of Business Development at Nextera provided him with extensive experience at the nexus of energy and environment and the meeting of the public and the private sector. I know the Minister is a great outdoorsman, our theme today about how we love uh, the, this place we call home, and it's a great pleasure to welcome him to the stage for the conversation about how Alberta and Canada can work together to advance the energy transition. Thank you. Welcome. Um, okay, first, uh, full disclosure, Somebody in this room may have said dingbats from Ottawa. I'm not going to say who, but there's a reason behind it, and I wasn't, uh, you're from Saskatchewan, so you don't, you don't fit. But we'll, first of all, welcome. I feel like um, this is coming into territory that gets, uh, that gets challenging for you. How do you see it when you come into Alberta and you have, have work to do? What is it like for you and for your department? Uh, I actually don't see it as challenging at all to come into Alberta and have conversations um, in the same way that I don't feel it awkward to go into Saskatchewan, which is where I grew up to have it. Um, Canada is, a, as folks in this room will know, is a very complicated country. Um, every province and territory in this country has unique characteristics, has unique resources, has unique challenges. And I think the, the role of the Minister of Natural Resources is to engage provinces and stakeholders that, uh, that exist within provinces and certainly First Nations and other Indigenous communities within provinces on the basis of the aspirations that they have and trying to work together to figure out how to do that in a manner that is consistent with fighting climate change, um, ensuring we are acting in a responsible manner environmentally and trying to figure out pathways through which you build economies that are going to be strong in the future. Do you, are you optimistic and hopeful on that, on that pathway? I am. Um, I mean, specifically with Alberta, I would say there are certainly unique sets of challenges. Um, you know, it is the heartland of the oil and gas industry in this country. Um, and as we think forward to a world that must necessarily be a lower carbon world, um, and that is a scientific claim, it is not a partisan or a political claim, um, we need to be thinking about how we actually have a thoughtful approach to addressing the oil and gas sector, just as every other sector. We have to be thoughtful about how we ensure that Alberta will have a strong economy in a future that needs to look different. And there are enormous opportunities for Alberta. I would say that uh, when I go around the country and I look at the opportunity sets that exist in different provinces and territory, uh, territories, Alberta is right at the top of the list. Like there are so many things that can be done here that will create jobs and economic opportunity in the context of the fight against climate change. Tell me a bit about um, your sense of the working relationship. And I know there is rhetoric and, and noise notwithstanding. There is, a, there is a working group between Ottawa and Alberta. How is that going and what sort of things are you seeing happen? Yeah, I mean, one of, the, one of the challenges I think at times that we have is, is we let political debates infect conversations around policy. And, um, 
And I actually think that sometimes it's better for politicians to stay out of some of the conversations around policy and to try to advance uh, conversations that can actually lead to outcomes that are shared. Um, that was the idea behind setting up the Alberta Canada Working Group. Um, the first couple of items that we have been working on at that table, and it is officials at that table, not ministers, are the clean electricity regulation and how do we actually get to a clean grid in a thoughtful way that acknowledges that Alberta's challenges are different from Quebec's and they're different from British Columbia's. Um, and the second is the regulatory process associated with being able to deploy small modular reactors, which obviously is, is complicated, especially for a jurisdiction that has no experience with nuclear power. Um, and those conversations actually have gone very well, and we've made lots of progress at the table. Um, you wouldn't necessarily know that from some of the things that you hear um, from, from politicians with, with respect to, uh, to the clean electricity reg, but I would just tell you that there are pathways to find, um, to find common ground that can enable us to move forward in a manner that will ensure not this, that the grid is not emitting, but that the grid is reliable and the grid is affordable for consumers and, and, and is a competitive advantage for industry. And you can either start from the perspective of saying, well, we just disagree with the, the regulation and we're not going to actually comply with it. Or you can actually engage that conversation by saying, these are the kinds of things that we are concerned about and that would need to change for it to actually work for our jurisdiction. That's the conversation we, we should be engaging. And I will tell you, that is the conversation that's happening at the working table. And when uh, the, the Premier was here and she was talking about the, the time frame in the window is just not possible. What's your sense of that? Well, look, um, again, I recognize that different provinces and territories have uh, different um, challenges and that it is more difficult for Alberta and Saskatchewan, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick than it would be for British Columbia or for Quebec, for example. But I, I will tell you, we just went through this process with New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and announced an agreement with both premiers in Ottawa last week about how we're going to work together to get to yes, to get to a place where we actually can make it work, both with respect to the phase out of coal and also with respect to the in implementation of the clean electricity reg. In the conversations that we're having with Alberta, the reg was put out at what's called CG1 as a draft. And what we said was that we were open to engaging conversations about flexibilities that might be needed specifically in some of the jurisdictions to ensure that it is actually doable. We all have an interest in a grid that is not emitting, but we also all have a grid, an interest in a grid that is reliable and affordable. And the idea that somehow the federal government wants to see blackouts in, in, in Alberta, that, that wants to see electricity rates, you know, double in Alberta, well, that's just, that's just nonsense. Um, uh, at the end of the day, we need to find pathways to ensure that we are getting to that grid and, and that we're providing the flexibilities that are required, but it is doable. And that's how we got to yes with New Brunswick. That's how we got to yes with Nova Scotia, because their premiers had the courage to actually say, let's figure out a way to get it done. In the, um, I was talking with Janet Brown, our pollster who knows so much about Albertans. And she was saying that the interesting thing about most Albertans is most Albertans, but they think they're the only one. They think that everyone else is really far left and really far right, and they're standing there by themselves, when in fact, most of us are in the middle wanting to find a way to do it. The other thing that she pointed out that I thought was really interesting, because it's me, and it is the story of, of what I do, is anywhere else you go in Canada, if you have a choice, and it's binary, either you're pro-environment or you're pro-oil and gas, and you can't be both. Whereas here, many of us, the buildings we live, the, the down, the, the, our whole, our families, our parents and our grandparents owe a lot to the oil and gas industry. So we're not, a lot of us, myself included, feel cornered into saying, either I have to say this is an industry that has done our province well, or I'm an environmentalist, but there's no way to sort of say, can we not acknowledge that this is a great engine? And yes, it needs to change and we need to do things. As a person who's lived in Saskatchewan and understands business, what's your take on that sort of binary other places and not so binary here? Well, I think, I think it, it, it may be binary in some other jurisdictions. I, I, would, I would caution Alberta to see itself as, as alone in that regard. I would tell you in Newfoundland and Labrador, they feel exactly the same way. They, 
do in Saskatchewan as well, and in, in uh, many parts of British Columbia that are major, especially gas producers, but also oil producers. Where, where you find that binary thing is often in provinces that actually have either no or very little um, investment in the oil and gas space. And so it's very easy in some of those provinces to simply be opposed to the sector and to say it is the cause of climate change. And therefore, we need to actually ensure that we are phasing out the sector. But I think in, in the provinces uh, like Alberta, but the others as well, there is a better understanding that this has, or a deeper understanding that um, this has been an important economic engine. Um, and that we actually need to be thinking about how we continue to extract value from this as we move forward to a future in which the volumes of oil and gas that we are going to be using are going to inevitably start to decline. Um, and, and, and I would say that perhaps we haven't done a very good job of telling that story at times. Um, because, you know, it, there is this view. Uh, my youngest daughter is at the University of Toronto, and she would tell you that fossil fuels are the enemy, um, and you need to, to, uh, to essentially eliminate fossil fuels. Um, but the reality is, between now and 2050, there are significant amounts of oil and gas that are going to continue to be used in combustion applications and non-combustion applications as we do things like deploy more in the way of electric vehicles and, and move on a pathway that will, again, eventually see a decline in the value. But even beyond a net zero 2050 future, there's still a significant amount of oil and gas that will be used in non-combustion applications that have no impact on climate change, whether that is the production of low carbon hydrogen, it is carbon graphite, it is solvents, it is waxes, it is petrochemicals. And, and so we've gotten ourselves into this sort of binary conversation where it's either fossil fuels or it's climate change. There is a pathway through which you actually can do both. Now, I'm not going to pretend that the volumes are going to not decline as you get rid of combustion applications, but there are so many opportunities as you actually move through this to actually build other areas of value, whether it's in critical minerals and critical minerals processing, it's hydrogen production, it's biofuels, it's a range of electricity generation technology, wind, solar, geothermal, et cetera, um, that, you know, my worry about the future here in Alberta and in many provinces and territories is not that we are going to have a lot of displaced workers. It's we're not going to have nearly the number of workers that we actually need to build the economy of the future. Well, we had a great uh, panel conversation this morning about that. And uh, we can, I, you know what, let's just go right to it. So talk a little bit about Alberta workers and the act, the Sustainable Jobs Act, and how you see that playing into our province here. Well, I think it certainly plays into this province, but it plays into other provinces as well. People will remember that the original sort of moniker that was used was the just transition. Um, and we changed that, and we changed that for a couple of reasons. One was because there are certainly many people, in, particularly in oil and gas producing um, provinces, that saw that as in some way demeaning the work that they do. Um, that somehow, you know, folks who live in Toronto were, were effectively saying through the utilization of those words that people should be happy that their jobs were going to be transitioned um, into the future. And the other was that I actually am of the view that the economic opportunities of the future, especially for a country like Canada, and I think Canada is advantaged relative to almost every other country in the world in this regard, is we have the opportunity, if we are thoughtful, if we are strategic, to build an economy that will thrive, that will create enormous prosperity for Canadians in a low carbon future. And it's about creating the jobs that are sustainable in that way, that are long term and lasting as we move through the transition. And so it absolutely relates here. It relates to the decarbonization of the oil and gas space through the implementation of carbon capture, through methane related, reduction related technologies, but it also relates to building building jobs that actually utilize very similar skill sets in biofuels refining, in hydrogen production, and in a range of other things. So it is about ensuring that we have voices from labor, from industry, indigenous peoples, and youth that actually are advising us on an ongoing basis about how the government should be thinking about these things going forward. One of the big points that came out of the conversation this morning was that the, the labor uh, is represented at the table and how important that is, and that is something you take seriously. We take it very seriously. In fact, you know, the legislation um, and the Sustainable Jobs Act was, uh, I wouldn't say quite co-developed, but it was, certainly was developed with the active participation of the labor movement in this country. Is there a concern in, uh, in the world of renewables and in the world of encouraging investment and encouraging entrepreneurs to make a living here 
that the United States has a huge market and has a fairly straight and clear line to resources that people are going to go there? Well, I think, that, look, uh, you always have to start from the basis of where do you actually think Canada's comparative advantages are. Like, we are never going to compete across the board with the Americans, just as we will never compete across the board with the European Union on everything. Um, but Canada has a whole bunch of things that actually are advantages relative to our friends in the United States. Um, some of them relate to, to, to the resources like wind and solar that we actually have available here, although there are parts of the United States that also have significant resources. Part of it relates to things like critical minerals where the United States is desirous of partnering with Canada because we actually have far more, far more than they do in the context of what is an emerging sort of important area in the geopolitical arena in terms of, of security of uh, energy going forward. Um, in terms of hydrogen, the gas resources that we have here and the work that we have done to actually reduce the carbon intensity of the gas that we are producing is a significant comparative advantage. So, you know, I would say the biggest threat to us was the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States where they brought into place um, something that we should all applaud uh, in the sense that it was the Americans taking a big step forward in the context of fighting climate change. But they did it through just massive spending. I mean, some people estimated at the beginning it was $378 billion or something. I mean, it is way north of a trillion dollars as it actually gets implemented. And, and so what it required from Canada was a response. We had been spending significant funds. We had put in place a number of regulations. We had put in place a price on carbon pollution, which helps in terms of actually equalizing between just, just spending. But we then came forward in the last budget with essentially a response around mainly investment tax credits to actually put projects on a similar footing in Canada. Um, and I think that in most sectors that we have chosen, uh, we have been able to do that. There are a few other places uh, that we actually, I think, do need to make some adjustments. But, uh, but I think that, that uh, we are going to see significant capital inflows into this country that will help us to build these, the, these uh, sectors of the economy that are going to be so important going forward. Uh, during the, we had a, a chat this morning on the grid, and I'm, I'm not sure if I got it exactly right, but what they were saying is you are bringing a... a, a bucket load of money and you're just throwing it around. Is that true? Is that, did I get that right from the electrical people? What is your sense of what are the carrots that you can say, look, if you are serious about making a difference when it comes to this work, when it comes to the grid, we are there to, to give you the credits that you need. So the grid, uh, I mean, as folks in this room will understand, the grid kind of underpins everything else, right? Um, it's not just about decarbonization of the existing grid, um, you know, getting off coal and, and eventually getting off um, unabated gas. But it's also about being able to actually scale the grid such that you can electrify transportation, you can electrify buildings. Um, and you can actually be a place that can attract industry. Increasingly, industry is going to have to and is having to account for the carbon that is actually embedded in the products they sell. And so, you know, part of the sort of the, 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 the table stakes going forward for provinces and territories that want to attract large-scale industrial investment is going to be having a grid that is affordable, reliable, non-emitting, and abundant. Um, and so the federal government recognizes that we fully respect that, that the electricity grid is an area of provincial jurisdiction. But we also understand that we are going to have to work with provinces and provide supports to provinces because the scale of the challenge that is in front of provinces and territories is very significant. And so, you know, for example, that was part of the deal that we did last week with New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, which was we are going to work together to deploy the tools that we actually have at our disposal, whether that is the investment tax credits, it's what's called the SREP fund, where we actually fund renewable energies, it's pre-development funding for small modular reactors and a range of other things, to actually enable them to make the progress that they know they need to make. And so, uh, so it's not spreading the money around hazardly. It actually is very strategic, and some of those credits associated with electricity um, are very new in the Canadian context. We haven't really done that before, and we certainly have never before made it available to public utilities, which we have now, which is not as relevant to, to Alberta, but it certainly is to provinces like Saskatchewan. I want to talk uh, a, a bit about housing and a bit about COP, but uh, while we're on electrical, 
if you talk to any, I used to do a show where we'd have rock bands come in, young kids come in with their gear, pulling out a van, stinking like weed, getting in and doing the show. Uh, now they're all here. No, um, <laughs> but, yeah, exactly. Uh, however, one of the things that they'll point out is if you're a touring band in the States, it's way easier because 15 minutes down the road is a whole other town. Here you've got to drive and drive and drive and drive and drive. So that's one of our realities. So when it comes to trucking and the elect electrification of trucking, what do you see as the future of that and what are we doing to say we're going to have charging stations that actually are useful and allow us to travel across the country electrically? Yeah, so the trucking space is, is at this stage, probably the more challenging area um, in the transportation side. We are seeing increasing deployment of electric vehicles, um, and we have been building out the charging infrastructure. Actually, one of the one of the interesting facts that was in the uh, the World Energy Outlook, which the IEA put out um, just this week, was the fact that some of these changes are happening faster than we actually even understand. Um, in 2020, one in 25 cars sold around the world were electric vehicles. Last year, it was one in five. That is an amazing change in three years. Trucking is more challenging, and I, and I would say that we're not yet at the space where the technology choice is, is entirely clear. Um, my view, my personal view, I certainly could be wrong about this, but is that especially heavy-duty trucking is probably less likely to be electric and more likely to be hydrogen. Um, and there are a whole range of technical reasons for that. Um, but the nice thing about once you actually make that technology choice, you obviously then have to figure out how you're going to drive some of the, the experience curve costs as you're actually trying to build volume for the, for the trucks themselves. Um, but the, the infrastructure is not nearly so complicated, right? You actually have to build it at certain sites. It's not like electric vehicle charging stations where you've got to do it everywhere. And, uh, and so the federal government has played a significant role in the building out of the initial electric vehicle charging infrastructure, and we recognize that we are going to have to do the same thing with respect to, uh, to hydrogen, or at least partner with companies to enable them to do it, but to ensure that they are actually doing it, um, especially at the beginning, in a manner that can be cost effective for their businesses. Housing in general, I know, is an issue that the federal government faces, as every jurisdiction faces. Uh, we can talk about this for hours. Talk a little bit about the incentives or the, the concerns or even the viewpoint you have on making sure people are either building homes that are most efficient, but also retrofitting homes that aren't in a way that is. Yeah, so um, it's interesting. When you think about trying to address the different sectors of the economy and eliminate emissions, um, a lot of people jump to, you know, well, it's hardest in the oil and gas sector or it's hardest in the transportation sector. I would actually tell you it's hardest in the building sector. Um, you know, 70% approximately of the buildings that are standing today will still be standing in 2050. That means every one of them will have to go through some kind of deep retrofit. That's really daunting. Um, and certainly every building that we are actually building as we move forward will also need to be built to a higher level of energy efficiency. Um, we have started with a number of different pieces. Uh, one of them is the Greener Homes Program, where we actually provide grants to people to enhance the energy efficiency of their homes. Um, and that could be insulation, it could be windows, it could be installing a heat pump, it could be a whole range of things. Today we announced uh, about another half a billion dollars for heat pump replacements, um, focusing initially on Atlantic Canada, where disproportionately people use heating oil. Um, uh, but certainly expanding across to other provinces that are interested in partnering with the federal government on the installation of heat pumps, which essentially are the major, I mean, it's the heating systems that are the major source of emissions in, in buildings, right? Um, and certainly we are looking going forward at a range of other things. We will be coming forward with a green building strategy later this year, early next year. Um, but we recognize that part of it will, will certainly be carrots, but, but part of it will be codes. Um, there will have to be a point at which, in not too distant future, that, that when you're building a new home, you actually need to build it with a heat pump and not with a natural gas furnace. Um, and, uh, and those are the kinds of things that are going to have to get addressed through, uh, through the development of, of codes and standards. Uh, coming up at COP, I just want to get your sense of this, and I, I wrote it. Glasgow, uh, we said Canada would cap oil and gas emissions today and reduce them tomorrow. So now we're going to Dubai. What is the federal message there? Well, 
I mean, the, the, the federal message will be not just about, about uh, the oil and gas sector, it will be about uh, what we're doing across the economy. Um, and certainly we will have some things to say uh, about nuclear power. Um, we will also, we work in a group called the Net Zero Producers Forum, which includes Norway, the United Kingdom, the United States, Saudi Arabia, uh, Qatar. Um, we will be having some things to say about methane reduction um, and work that we are doing uh, on methane reduction amongst the group. But we also will have to speak to, to the oil and gas cap. Uh, we are the first country that is committed to looking at a cap um, and then to reducing emissions in line with achieving the kinds of emissions reductions that need to be made. Um, and, and I think what we, we certainly intend to do is to be able to at least outline the methodology that we will be using in the context of actually looking at that cap. And, and of course, you know, you have to do things that are reasonable. You can't just do things that are crazy, that are impossible. Um, and so that needs to ensure that as we think about what that cap is going to look like, um, and the levels that the cap would be set at for 2030, that we have to think about technical feasibility. And that's technical feasibility in the context of the time that we have remaining between now and 2030, which is not very long. You have to think about what other things could be done from a compliance perspective to enable the sector to go even further than what they can do from a technical perspective, whether that's offsets or contributing to some kind of a technology fund or other things. And of course, you have to speak to what is sort of the, the expectation from a demand um, perspective globally going to be for, for oil and gas. So we do intend to have a number of things to say, but we're, you know, I would say the federal government's not, not um, unthoughtful in the context of trying to ensure that we are doing this in a manner that is feasible. At the end of the day, we need to reduce emissions from oil and gas. It's the largest single source of emissions in the Canadian economy. We have to reduce emissions in every sector of the economy. And we're not just picking on oil and gas, it's everywhere that we actually have to make those reductions. But we have to do it in a thoughtful way. We have to do it in a way that does not unnecessarily shut in Canadian production and simply move that to Saudi Arabia or Iran. That makes no sense. It doesn't help from a climate perspective and it, sim and it hurts from an economic perspective. So we will be having that conversation domestically before we go to COP. We will be having that conversation at COP. It is one of the items that we will be talking about with Alberta under the, uh, the Canada-Alberta Working Group. Final question. Um, uh, sometimes people care, uh, well, when you came in, they said, here's the good COP. And the Minister of the Environment is the bad COP. And, uh, and sometimes it feels like you can say, all right, all you entrepreneurs, get out there. And then he'll say, I'm not here to make friends. What's your take? Well, I, I, I would start by saying I used to be the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change, so maybe I was the bad cop, I don't know. Um, I, I mean, everybody has a different style, right? Um, I, I work very closely with Minister Gilbo, um, and he is a very thoughtful uh, fellow who has spent his life dedicated to fighting climate change. Um, and I have enormous respect for the work that he did before politics, and I have enormous respect for the work that he does in politics. Um, he comes from a background that is about challenge. And, and that, you know, when you're in Greenpeace, it's about challenge. It's about pushing the envelope. And sometimes, perhaps, that comes across in public communications. Um, I come from a background, the first, the first job I had out of uh, graduate school um, was as a, a federal provincial relations specialist for the government of Saskatchewan. And, and I fundamentally believe that Canada works best when Canadians work together. And that what Canadians really want is the federal government and provinces and territories to endeavor to actually find ways to have constructive conversations and not be throwing sticks at each other across the fence. And so I'm not sure it's necessarily good cop, but I try in the work that I do to listen very hard to what people are saying and to try to be creative about finding ways to get to objectives or get to out endpoints where we can both get something out of that, that achievement. Um, I don't think that uh, that is a lot different from Stephen, but perhaps it, it's a stylistic thing. It's not good cop, bad cop. He and I work together, joined at the hip. Most of the policies that come out from my department or for his are things that we have jointly developed and worked on. It's, uh, we, could, we could go, but I appreciate you uh, <laughs> spending the time. Um, and there's good, you did very well. <laughs> nice, good. <laughs> Anyone else need to yell? Are we good? Are we good? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm talking about uh, phasing out gas premises and, and uh, requiring heat pumps, and you said that's not in the near, not so in the, it sounded like it was near future. Is there, is there any 
legislation that's coming down the pipeline on that? Or? No, no legislation. It's part of the conversation we, we intend to have with Canadians when we release the green building strategy. We've been consulting on it for a long period of time, but obviously we want to get to a point um, where we're not building uh, buildings that are going to have to be retrofitted yet again um, by 2050. And so there will be discussion about how we actually move through that and what some of the options are in the green building strategy that will come later this year. What do you think we would need to stop allowing gas by the end of this decade? So, I don't want to get into specific timelines, but I would say that clearly in areas like building codes, we will need to be working with provinces and territories, but certainly I would say beyond 2030 or so, I think it would behoove us to really reflect on ensuring that we are not getting into a position where we're going to have to go back and retrofit buildings yet again in 2050. I want to ask you about um, Ottawa today coming out of the IAA kind of changes, how things are going to be rejigged a little bit. One of those is removing, yeah, removing the Environment Minister's authority to kind of like, you know, force major projects to be judged from an environmental uh, impact yeah, standpoint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you were the last minister to do that. How are these changes, A, would that have been a real pain for you? And B, how are these changes actually going to work in practical sense? For you? So I think what Minister Gilbo announced today were the interim measures that we're putting into place in advance of coming forward with amendments. Um, and in the context of ensuring that we are giving uh, you know, thoughtful consideration to what those amendments will look like, he's pausing the use of what is called the power of designation. Um, that is rarely used. It's only been used a few times in the past while. I did use it um, when I was Minister of the Environment. Um, and he has not said that the power of designation will not exist beyond um, beyond uh, the amendments, but but it's a pause. I mean, we're trying to be thoughtful about how we respond to the Supreme Court's decision. It will take some time to get the amendments in place to ensure that we are changing the act as uh, as the Supreme Court has directed. Um, and so uh, we're going to do the appropriate thing. And just to follow up on that, um, what is the Supreme Court decision? What does that mean for the two federal impact assessments underway for the Ring of Fire? Is there a might that not need to continue? Oh no, uh, I mean, one of those is a regional assessment that will continue. Um, certainly there are clearly areas of federal jurisdiction that are drawn into the Ring of Fire, including engagement with indigenous communities that live around the Ring of Fire. Um, so those will continue, but, but I think what Minister Gubau said in the announcement this morning is that the Impact Assessment Agency will continue to focus on, on ensuring that the areas that we are working on are scoped so that they are actually very much tied to areas of federal authority. Um, to be honest with you, that's the way it worked in practice anyway when I was <laughs> Minister of the Environment and, and subsequently when, when Minister Gabo was there. Um, but we will make sure that they are done in a manner that we are not treading into provincial jurisdiction. The guidelines on COP, you, have you reached an agreement yet with the Alberta government on a joint incentive package to get carbon capture utilization and storage projects going? Well, we are working actively on that with uh, the government of Alberta. I think Premier Smith had something to say about that a few weeks ago in terms of how Alberta thought it, that we could contribute. Um, there are a few pieces to that. We've been very public about our investment tax credit. It will need to be coupled with the, the money that, that Alberta is directing towards this. Um, there is then a conversation around things like contracts for differences that are ongoing with the Pathways folks, but we certainly hope to be in a position to actually have something to say with Alberta and Pathways in the near term. But you don't have a deal right now? We do not have a deal right now. Okay, and the other thing she said is, is that because the federal government gets more, more tax revenue from these projects, they should actually provide more money to the incentives. Is that something that you're considering doing, or have you basically drawn a line in the sand on how much Audible will contribute? Well, we, we came forward with the investment tax credits. I think the investment tax credits are, uh, are pretty robust. Um, they actually cover a significant portion of the capital cost of these projects. I don't think we're looking at actually augmenting that. We are engaged, though, in conversations around things like contracts for difference, which attempt to provide some degree of certainty around the credit values uh, that are associated. And, and those conversations are ongoing. The guidelines for C69 today were um, brief, and I know you said that the work is being done on it, but do you think that this does enough in the interim to provide the certainty and stability and clarity that the government said it was hoping for from both an interprovincial perspective and a business investment perspective? So, uh, first of all, I would say, um, just, just, to, just to stick on a point, is it's not Bill C69, it's the Impact Assessment Act. It, it's, it's through. The element so, of C69. Yeah, yes. yeah. So, um, so, uh, we do believe that the steps today actually provide 
clarity for proponents in terms of how this is going to operate for those that are already in the process. Um, but we also know that in order to provide full clarity, we need to come forward with the amendments. Um, you know, we need to actually amend the legislation to ensure that everybody understands the rules of the game. But I would say, and I think most proponents understand, that the way in which we have implemented the Act um, has always been in a manner that actually looked at areas of federal jurisdiction. And, and so I think today clarifies that that is what we intend to do going forward. I think that will be a significant enabler for proponents. And I would expect that we will come forward with amendments in the, in the not too distant future. You Minister, Minister Gilbo <coughs> said, um, or hinted at the fact that it could take months. So are we going to be in a position where we're seeing emissions cap, all this other stuff, and these amendments coming at the same time? Or what, what is the order of operations that you're hoping to have this done in as these policies all affect the sector? So, uh, you know, we don't have a specific time frame on it. Obviously, we want to ensure that our lawyers in the Department of Justice are being thoughtful about how the amendments are going to work, and obviously that involves my department, it involves Mr. Gilbo's department. Um, the, uh, the other issues relating to the, Canadian, uh, the, the electricity regulation and the emissions cap are proceeding forward. Um, the electricity regulation has gone through what's called CG1, and we're in that consultation period, and ideally we will be able to move forward with the reg um, in the next few months. Um, the cap, you know, is something that we have not brought forward. We are still in conversations with Alberta and others about the nature and the form of that cap, and we're going to take the appropriate time before we actually uh, bring that forward publicly. We want to make sure that we've at least had some good conversation about it. So. Will it uh, happen this year? Do you expect those rates on the cap to come this year, or are we talking about 2024? I would expect that a framework uh, will come forward this year, but uh, and the Prime Minister I think said that a few weeks ago, that there will be a framework in terms of how the cap kind of will be structured from a methodological perspective, um, but I don't expect that we will actually uh, be moving forward with, with uh, regulations this year. You said that you wanted to uh, keep uh, this out of court, you don't want to go back to court again. How can you keep it from being challenged? All over again, if all you can do is just make amendments, as opposed to an entirely new law. Well, I mean, the, the, the Supreme Court ruling was pretty clear, right? Uh, there were certain areas where they actually specifically said that they felt that the act was not sufficiently tethered to areas of federal jurisdiction. So th those are the areas where we need to go back and ensure that the language is tightened up. There may be a need for some consultation um, before we actually come back with an amendment package, but, but certainly the court did not say that the, the act fully was unconstitutional. It said it was constitutional in part, unconstitutional in part because it was not sufficiently tethered in some areas to federal jurisdiction. We're going to tighten those up and come back with a package of amendments. How fast is the hydrogen car off the line? Hey, the hydrogen car is very fast off the line. It uses the same kind of electric motor as an electric car. So, What would you say to the Albertans that are maybe not very confident that we are going to be able to reach that 20, uh, 2035 goal, but still want to reach that goal? What, what's your message to those, I guess, uh, climate-conscious Albertans that are hearing some of the messaging from, from our premier? Well, my, my message would be that, that we want to work with Albertans and and uh, and with the government of Alberta to find a pathway to enable achievement of the intentions of the clean electricity reg, and that certainly can involve some flexibilities that actually make it work in the Alberta context. But as I said in my speech, you can either take the position that it's never going to work and we're not going to engage, or you can say, okay, we want to engage the conversation, we agree on the objective, let's figure out the flexibilities that will work in this context. And as I said, um, I did exactly that with New Brunswick and Nova Scotia last week. They both actually have bigger challenges with respect to coal than Alberta does, and they have found a pathway to say yes. I am hopeful that we will do that through the Canada-Alberta uh, Working Group table. And, and we can marry climate consciousness on the part of the vast majority of Albertans with ensuring the, the reliability of the overall electricity system. Does that include the timeline, flexibility on the 2035 timeline, or is that stuck? Is that fixed? Well, there are already flexibilities under that, in the same way that there are with the uh, the regs in the uh, in the United States under the Environmental Protection Act. Right now, under the proposal um, for uh, for the clean electricity reg, if you built a gas plant in Alberta in 2023, it can run for 20 years unabated. 
Um, so that's 2040, that's not 2035. So let's not get too hung up on the 2035 moniker. That is something to which Canada and all G7 countries have committed. And the focus is on reducing the, the emissions from the system and building a bigger system over time. There are flexibilities in the reg. If there needs to be a little bit more flexibility in the reg, we are open to that conversation. Minister, with some of those flexibilities in mind, but in, in broad strokes, given that Alberta right now gets about three quarters of its power from natural gas, how do you see it getting to a net zero capacity? And what role do you see uh, energy storage in particular playing? So, it's going to be an all of the above thing. Um, some of it is renewables, and Alberta has had the fastest renewable growth of any province in the country. Um, but certainly coupled with that is, is storage, um, large-scale storage, to be able to actually balance some of the intermittencies. It is about gas with carbon capture. I mean, Capital Power is looking to move forward with a project, and there are a number of other projects in, in Alberta that are looking to actually have natural gas-fired power plants with carbon abatement. Um, it is moving forward some of the conversations around small modular reactors, which probably are not pre-2035, but will be important after that. Um, so it's actually looking at all of those kinds of things, and certainly storage is important in that context. Um, last we, question. We really have to have a minister. Uh, will you be meeting anybody in the province uh, while you're here? Uh, well, I relationship with him and uh, he's straightforward there are sometimes we don't always fully agree but uh, but we have the ability to have those kinds of conversations and I think he's looking for the same thing that I am which is trying to find pathways through which we can get to an outcome that's just good for Alberta. But as it pertains to that flexibility I mean how productive were those conversations last night? Uh, they were good, uh, but I would say that, that the bulk of those conversations at this point, we are leaving to our respective officials. His deputy minister is the chair of that working group, or the co-chair, and my deputy minister is the co-chair, and they are actually working, and I would say they are making good progress. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.